Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, where we will be talking about how port weather forecasts can help with the maritime operations. Uh, joining us today are oh, Keenan Fryer from uh, Spire, just in time. <laughs> uh, we also have uh, Jasper Bossenkuhl from Port Chain, uh, and Terry Bills and Rafael Fernandez from Esri, who will be giving their expert uh, insight on the subject. Uh, we have Carl Jeffries as moderator, founder and editor of um, Digital Ship. Uh, before I hand over to him to introduce today's topic, let me just remind you that there is a Q&A session after the discussion, so you are encouraged to write your questions in the Q&A box pr provided. Thank you, Carl. Our topic today is how we can use weather data to make better plans for our maritime operations in a port. So we can get much more accurate weather predictions today. So if we can use them to make our plans, we're more likely to have a plan that we're able to follow. So that might mean a berth can handle more vessel calls in a year. And it mean we can make good predictions in advance of when the berths will be available. And we can tell the vessels so they can set their speed so they don't go faster than they need to. And better planning might mean less stress for everyone. So it fits with another theme which seems to be coming up a lot lately, which is taking a sort of manufacturing approach to port operations rather than letting everything go at its own speed. So there's lots of different ways that weather can impact port operations. There's currents, the waves, maneuvering into berth, whether it's safe to operate cranes or pile containers in high stacks, if there's severe weather events which stop us doing things. So the, weather today, the webinar today is sponsored by Spire, which is an American weather data analytics company. Our first speaker, Keenan Fryer, is an applied meteorologist with Spire. He's based in Boulder, Colorado. He's going to explain how weather can impact ports and why it's so important and show us how Spire can help. Then we've got a perspective from Jasper Busenkul, who's Senior Director of Sales with Port Chain in Rotterdam. That's a data analytics company for container terminals and carriers. He's going to go into depth about how weather impacts port operations, particularly with containers. Then we're going back to the US, and we're going to hear from Terry Bills, who's transport manager with Esri, which is the world's largest geographic information system company in Redlands, California. He's going to talk about how weather data, together with geographic information systems, can help us plan beta, what we can do with real-time weather data, together with digital maps. And he might have a story of the Port of Rotterdam, how it's seeking to double the number of vessel calls it can take. So we're going to give the floor for five to 10 minutes each to Keenan, Jasper and Terry. Then we should have a good 20 minutes for discussion. We're also going to be joined by Rafael Fernandez, who's the account manager, for, account manager for Port with Esri. And we're going to finish about an hour from now. And as uh, Neff said, please put your questions in and uh, we can take the questions by typing or, or at the end. So I'd like to invite Keenan to give his opening talk. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Carl. Uh, you guys can all see this right now? Yep. Perfect. All right. So um, good morning, everybody. I just uh, today I wanted to talk to um, there are a number of weather events that can impact port operations, as Carl's mentioned, severe weather, uh, precipitation, dropping visibility, tropical cyclones, etc. But today I did want to focus on winds and waves uh, in particular, and then I'll get a bit quickly into uh, some of Spire's forecast products that try and answer some of these questions. Um, so in a maritime environment, you're going to almost by definition see higher wind speeds. Um, and this is related to the fact that the maritime environment features a low surface roughness. And so like basically a, the atmosphere is like a, a fluid moving over the surface of the earth. And um, in an environment such as like a forest, you're going to have a higher drag coefficient on that fluid. And therefore the profile of wind speeds increasing with height is going to be much more gradual than the same environment over a, a you know, in a maritime environment where that low surface roughness means that there's a steeper profile to the vertical wind speeds. Um, and, and what this means for port operations is that any kind of verticality, so um, like cranes or uh, stacked containers, um, these are going to be subject to higher wind speeds than the same crane would at an inland location. This also factors into like wind gusts in ports where uh, they are 
by definition at the ocean land uh, interface. And so the, the turbulence that forms in that environment mixed with this uh, much steeper wind profile meaning that there's a higher potential for wind gusts to mix their way down to the surface, which can you know, destabilize crane operations and things to that nature. And, and these winds are going to drive directly uh, the waves that also impact a number of port operations, maybe in some obvious ways, like uh, making it more difficult to maneuver through a port or um, move off of the berth. Or so, so these wa these waves can be separated, can be thought of separate in separate ways. Uh, so there's a a swell component and a wind wave component, and some people may already be familiar with these. The idea, though, is that wind waves are going to be generated in place by wind, but swell waves really are generated by wind as well. They are, they are propagating waves out from that initial wind, wind source. And so this problem of forecasting wave heights is really one that kind of balances both the need for local as well as a remote, you know, global perspective in that wind waves are going to be affecting an area much closer to their source region, whereas swell waves will spread more generally. And I, and I should just mention that uh, as, the, as we go into a warming climate, as the sea surface rises, sea surface height rises, these waves are going to be perturbed on top of a increasingly average, a uh, higher average sea surface height, which can be increasingly impactful to port infrastructure and that like. Uh, just to get into our, our, a number of our products quick. Uh, so we have this port optimized forecast, which is tailored specifically to this purpose in that it involves uh, a number of NWP numerical weather prediction inputs and then optimizes the forecast at these locations specific to these locations. And then we'll bias correct these forecasts using historical as well as real time observations. And the, this, uh, this system can actually take a number of custom locations. I'll get into that more in a moment. Um, we have our global point forecast. So this is a deterministic model that has fields such as wind gusts. We have a wind um, wave heights, ocean currents. We have tidal predictions globally. Then we get into this forecast by route product where we're trying to solve this issue of if you need to plan the weather, the, the weather uh, a route and are looking at the weather, it, it, it gives you an provided a series of waypoints for your route, it will provide back a, a series of forecast variables along that route rather than having to check where the vessel will be and then what the weather will be at the location. Um, and now I'll finish up by talking quick about this uh, maritime safety insight product that that um, produces a warning signal, uh, you know, green, red, yellow, based on a number of input fields. Um, so here's just an example of some of our port locations. Uh, you know, the really cool thing about this system is that a user can define custom locations that then this system will train up on using uh, observations that are nearby to, to do that correction and that uh, optimization problem. And, and this does get into that uh, local idea and, and specifically, you know, focusing on the local effects. And so this system has uh, air temperature and pressure, wind speeds, direction, probability of fog, precipitation, a number of types of precipitation, as well as visibility. Um, here I'm just showing a quick dashboard that's an example of our, uh, our, our global API, point API feeding into a dashboard where you see the wind gusts and our wave heights, as well as in the bottom right, uh, an example of some tide heights. And then just to finish on the maritime risk insights. So this was developed uh, in conjunction with uh, maritime uh, spires meteorological knowledge base uh, in conjunction with um, maritime safety and industry experts in order to derive a algorithm that uses a number of um, atmospheric inputs and maritime inputs such as wave direction, wave height, to give a warning criteria for each segment of a provided route. So here in the yellow, we're highlighting that there's a section where the wind direction provides some, you know, present some risk to the vessel. And so this system is going to take a number of uh, inputs uh, like wind speed and determine a value, a risk value from there. It then will, these risk factors are going to vary depending upon, they sometimes can involve multiple atmospheric fields, such as icing risk is the example we have here, uh, which includes temperature or wind speed. 
And that produces a numerical number value, which is then mapped to a you know, red, yellow, green uh, warning signal that is weighted by the input vessel that is being looked at. There's just an example of some output from that. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Keenan. Okay, so now we're going uh, in the east of London to Rotterdam. We're going to hear from Jasper Busenkul, who's uh, from uh, Port Chain. I'm just looking at his LinkedIn page, some interesting things. He's been Director of Innovation and Future Technology with Maersk, and he has a PhD with Experimental Physics from Utrecht University. So I'd like to welcome Jasper. Cheers. Yeah, thanks, Carl, for the introduction. Um, so my name is Jasper Busenkol, and I'll uh, give some perspective from the uh, container uh, industry uh, and the operational impact that weather can have on, on its operations. We're working closely with container terminals and carriers to improve um, planning and scheduling, scheduling, and weather can have quite some impact and disruption on the whole logistics chain uh, and, and also on operational perform performance. So also at the end, show a little bit how we use AES data from Spire to assist container terminals and carriers on one of their biggest challenges, improve the planning and transparency around arrival time of, of vessels. But first, let me introduce a little bit Portchain. Portchain is actually Danish. It is, um, I'm based in Rotterdam, but the company is Danish. Uh, it's founded four years ago by um, three McKinsey consultants working extensively on digital transformation in the shipping industry. And, and they saw this huge challenge that many of you working in container logistics will, will recognize. There's a lot of improvement potential if terminals and carrier were better to align and collaborate and exchange data on, on port calls. Things like when will the vessel actually arrive? How many containers will be loaded and unloaded? And is the berth still available by the time that the vessel arrives? Um, many have tried to quantify the potential improvement. That's, of course, a little bit difficult, but it's estimated that on an annual basis, some 15 billion euros is wasted simply due to problems in planning port calls. Either carriers speed up to arrive at the terminal um, at the given time slot with a lot of excess fuel consumption, only to find out that the berth is not available uh, due to some unforeseen delays of the previous port call. Or on the other side, terminals keep the time slot free and order cranes and gangs to work on the vessel only to find out that the vessels experience some, some delay mid-ocean and, and will be late. So there's a huge opportunity if carriers and terminals are collaborating better on, on planning port calls and exchanging data. And Portchain has been founded to, to address some of those challenges. So Portchain focuses on artificial intelligence driven digital planning tools, both for carriers and terminals. On the carrier side, we have the digital birth alignment platform, essentially a um, platform to replace the existing um, planning process to negotiate and aligning vessel rotations with their port calls uh, between carriers and terminals. Um, by digitizing the process by a light and easy platform, you can create that, that digital handshake between carriers and terminals on, on scheduling their, their port calls. On the terminal side, we have our birth optimization engine, and that's really centered around the birth planning at a container terminal. In our experience, the challenge of birth planning is sometimes a bit underestimated and underserved in the industry, especially in today's market, planning constantly changes with respect to two essential parameters of, of planning. When does a vessel arrive, i.e. the ETAs, but also how much work should a terminal plan for or the number of moves to plan? Or in words of one of our clients, it used to be a pretty straightforward planning task because vessels kept their schedules and the number of moves were pretty stable. But nowadays, information changes constantly and what once was a very straightforward planning task has now transformed into one of the most complex and dynamic tasks at a, at a container terminal. So looking a little bit on the challenges of a container terminal, 
it all centered around when does the vessel arrive and what is the um, number of moves as that determines the amount of work and thereby either the length of the port stay or the number of cranes that a terminal needs to, uh, to deploy. And weather can be uh, quite a source of, of disruptions and, and uncertainty. Uh, but of course, terminals have seen many other disruptions um, as well, uh, such as the closure of Chinese ports due to COVID, uh, delays due to congestions in previous ports, or a vessel blocking the Suez Channel. And the poor terminal berth planning manager needs to deal with all these uncertainty and disruptions, especially when it comes to scheduling. So, um, digitizing the processes to save time and create that single source of truth could be extremely helpful. Also quite often, um, you have to predict and forecast some of the data that is uh, inaccurate. Um, number of moves, for instance, is pretty accurate 24 hours before operations. But if you want to plan two or three days in advance, it's hopelessly inaccurate and you're better off relying on on predicted number of moves in our experience. So that's what we're helping them with. And then also optimize their operations, um, especially um, trying to maximize the asset utilization. Um, birth space is pretty scarce. Cranes are pretty expensive. So trying to get the most out of the cranes and the birth space available is pretty Im important in order to um, order the right amount of, of labor. Uh, terminals usually have to plan that a day ahead. So you want to make sure that you order enough labor and cranes to complete the work in time because um, overtime is pretty expensive and leads to delay. But on the other hand, you don't want to order too much to avoid idle cranes or idle labor. And then you have to deal with all kinds of disruptions. Um, so sharing the birth plan, build a trust, and, and also speed in, in aligning what's, what's ahead of us. We've seen some of our clients sharing their birth plan with more than 600 people to be able to access um, the birth plan ahead to make sure that they then in turn can align their processes um, and, and optimize it. And then also you have to plan for different scenarios. Um, if you have a storm coming or something unexpected, it's good to plan in different scenarios and you can quickly evaluate different possible plans so you can better prepare, be, be prepared for possible disruptions. So if you turn then specifically to weather and the impact it can have, probably the most common challenge is bad weather somewhere mid-ocean that causes a vessel delay. Uh, currently in the industry, only like six to 10% of the vessels actually arrive on time. So scheduling is actually quite an extensive challenge for container uh, terminals. And it has a knock-on effect as it creates birthing conflicts and reallocations of, uh, of crane. And also terminal generally have to uh, open up their gates for receiving cargo that has to put on ships seven days in advance. So if a vessel is suddenly delayed by three days, it uses that sort of the gates are open too early, you get too much cargo in your yard. And if your yard is constrained and already congested, it leads to higher dwell times and uh, difficult operations, uh, slowing down operations. So quite a, quite a big problem. Um, also locally uh, in planning, High wind or fog or ocean mist can have impact on, on container terminals, uh, especially winds uh, that can cause um, entire vessels to sway a little bit alongside the quay or a container that's unloaded from a ship to sway midair. And a crane driver is 40 meters high and has to position either to pick up a container or position a container on very neatly on a chassis and it becomes extremely difficult if there's high winds. Um, it slows down uh, the whole operations. So the planner has to plan with a lower productivity and has to take into account longer uh, port stays in case of high winds. 
and even if they can um, sort of predict it a little bit ahead, they can plan uh, for that in terms of their gang planning or the number of cranes being used. In extreme conditions, uh, weather can close down a terminal for safety constraints. Uh, cranes need to be secured on the rail because the brakes could not be sufficient in extreme high uh, winds, so they need to be extra secured. Um, extreme seasonal winds, uh, for instance, the Caribbean and the Middle East can have a very strong impact on, on mooring lines and even causing them to snap, so all kinds of safety concerns. And of course, container stacks uh, can be knocked over, especially the empty stacks, because they are, they are relatively light. And all of that causes then immediate delays and ripple on effects, but also a peak load of clustering vessels to, uh, to catch up. Lastly, an example of how Port Chain incorporates Fire's AS data to optimize birth planning. Many of our customers today, they use a variety of data sources to estimate vessel arrival times. So they get information from agents, from carriers. They also use AS position information to see the current position of the vessel. And it may be um, thinking of, of a recent LinkedIn post I, I, I read that someone compared data with junk food. Managers and executives love it. They're addicted to it and always want more data, but it's not necessarily very healthy. Whereas data analytics is definitely part of a healthy diet if you have the right amount of data analytics in the right context. And that's what Portchain tries to do. Um, so that's what we're aiming for. We give terminals an overview of the vessels that they are planning. So this is an example of a, a Moroccan terminal. And seeing the vessels that are directly heading to your terminal and affecting your birth plan so that you can see what's coming your way and see whether the expected ETAs are still uh, relevant so that they can then proactively contact agents and carriers if vessels might be delayed. We also invested over the years quite a lot in um, uh, terminal data, so polygons around terminals, so that we can automatically detect if vessels depart a terminal and um, give them alerts along the way uh, to terminals to optimize their birth planning and, and terminal operations. So I hope you appreciate the importance of and the challenges of uh, terminal planning and planning ahead uh, and the impact that uh, weather disruptions and other uncertainties can have on terminal operations. Birth planning becomes increasingly important for efficient operations, and we're only at the start of the digitization journey, as I see it. So with that, back to you, Carl. Well, thank you very much, Jasper. And I'll have to think through that analogy about data and junk food. I guess it's uh, some people see data as junk food. Some people just want really good small amounts of data. So that's the uh, Californian approach. So now we'll go and hit to the uh, West Coast. We're going to hear from uh, Terry Bills, who's a transport manager of Esri, which is the world's largest geographic information system company. So I'd like to welcome Terry. Okay, thank you, Carl. And uh, a great segue. Uh, what we'd like to do over the a few minutes here is actually show um, how you can actually visualize uh, a lot of the data that uh, that Jasper was actually uh, just uh, just illustrating. So um, certainly in the current environment uh, with uh, very stressed uh, su global supply chains, one of the key challenges for any number of ports around the world is is really moving to 24 by 7 and and really kind of real-time operations and what we mean by that is how do you have a real-time view of everything that's going on uh, within the port and uh, let me start to sort of reinforce carl's point that uh, Part of that really is understanding uh, every vessel that uh, is on its way to your port. And so uh, this is an example. We really start with knowing the exact location of every vessel. This is just a sort of a nice example of looking at every vessel at, at a one-time uh, snapshot uh, around the world. Obviously, you can filter all of that and filter by uh, your port as the destination. But um, that's critically important important, uh, I think, as, as Jasper pointed out, for really getting a more accurate uh, estimated time of arrival uh, uh, for a vessel and, and uh, how, you know, can you ensure that your, the vessel does reach uh, the appropriate time windows. And, and I think, as Jasper also pointed out, weather is a 
critical uh, factor in all of that. So um, I'm going to turn actually to the port uh, side, and we're really actually looking at the port of Rotterdam here. And uh, they've actually um, very focused on port throughput, port efficiency, port optimization. Um, and as a result, they've really invested a significant amount in a wide number of sensors uh, and including uh, very detailed uh, weather information. So if you actually look at the screen on the lower right hand side there, uh, we'll turn to that and they actually have about uh, 15 to 20 of these what we call uh, dashboards monitoring everything from uh, the tides, uh, depth, uh, salinity of the water, uh, a whole host of information that actually impacts uh, the ability of a vessel to enter or exit uh, the port. Uh, given uh, the size of the vessels, there are a certain number of vessels that can only enter the port at, at certain tides. And so that's uh, critically important to not only understand tides, but waves and, and a whole host of, of weather information, um, including winds. Um, and so it really gets rolled up into this type of an executive dashboard, which is really looking at uh, not only what vessels are due to arrive, uh, but also marrying that to the, uh, the tides, the depths, the winds, uh, and also ultimately really trying to optimize um, the ETA, both uh, not just from an arrival time and meeting their birth assignments, but, but also uh, from a, uh, an environmental and, and carbon perspective. Uh, you can see that they do have the ability of uh, the alerts so that you can actually see there is an alert, an incoming storm, uh, which is actually impacting uh, traffic. And, and this is the type of real-time monitoring of the port uh, that I think uh, a large number of ports are, are moving to. Here's another example, uh, literally from Australia. This is the port of Flinders. They actually uh, are control uh, about 10 ports in Southern Australia uh, and um, monitor the weather uh, continuously in real time. And again, it's, it's even more critical in this particular instance. They have quite a difference in tides uh, and uh, given winds and other weather factors, it can actually uh, accentuate the uh, regular tidal flow. So it becomes uh, really quite critical that they uh, monitor weather in real time. You can see on the uh, tide uh, graph on the left-hand side, they're monitoring that as well as all of the real-time uh, weather information. And that is really quite critical, again, both uh, given the keel clearance uh, and times of day that uh, certain vessels can, can actually uh, uh, navigate into the port. Uh, in this particular case, they're really using uh, a uh, technology from Saab together with Esri, uh, using our maritime chart server technology so they can actually see the, uh, the actual maritime charts overlaid on the vessel positions and again together with all of the weather. And uh, that's really uh, used to not only manage uh, all of those ports, but really all of the uh, vessel traffic and keeping, uh, keeping uh, uh, detailed uh, information on, on each one of the vessels, their current position, their estimated uh, time of arrival. Uh, and that really gets down to the actual berth position uh, and the mooring, uh, mooring position, the, the mooring lines, the mooring crews. And again, uh, something that, that uh, weather uh, very significantly impacts so that uh, uh, at the port of Flinders, there are numerous instances where uh, high winds uh, really impacted the ability and, and again, the changes the configuration where they need to put the vessel, uh, what crews they need to mobilize. Uh, and all of that is really handled in, in real time with this real time visibility. Uh, and I think uh, ports worldwide are beginning to understand that really to improve 
report performance really does require uh, the type of analysis that Jasper was talking about, together with the visualization and the ability to do uh, analytics and the ability to do much better prediction uh, and much better control, because once you can visualize and analyze it, then you actually have uh, significantly increased control. And really where that's going is that, so uh, we have a dashboard and you maybe saw an example uh, from, uh, from uh, Keenan before, uh, all of the Spire data brought into a dashboard. And ultimately where that's really feeding is the type of operational dashboard that you see on the lower right, which is really looking at the port's performance and really how that weather uh, impacts uh, that port performance. So this is really, I think, where ports uh, ultimately want to be. How do we take advantage of the latest information, real-time information, in weather and vessel position, and how do we use that to ultimately optimize our port performance. And, and I think that's really, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, 360 degree view, uh, situational awareness, this is really what it's all about, is how do we continuously drive improved performance at our ports. So with that, uh, I will actually stop sharing and uh, we'll turn it back over, uh, over to you, Carl. Oh, well, thank you very much, Terry. Well, I think we've covered uh, science and technology and commercial issues and data analytics and the whole subject we've never uh, even thought about before. So I'd like to welcome everyone, invite everyone to turn your, your cameras on now and we'll go to the discussion session. And if anybody in the audience has any questions, there's only one there at the moment, but um, we can start with this, this one question because it looks quite interesting. I think I think Raphael is from a, the port of Setubal in Portugal, but he's asking about big ships. So I think LOI is a overall length of the ship. So as the container ships get longer and heavier, how much impact does that have on, on the weather? And he's asking about shore tension, which Google tells me is uh, for a sort of dynamic mooring thing that can adjust the mooring. Um, I'd like to introduce Rafael Fernandez, who's the uh, port specialist with Esri. I don't know, maybe the uh, port specialist on the panel, uh, Rafael and, and Jasper. I don't know if uh, either of you would like to start with that one. Do you think? Jasper, do you want to go ahead and start off and I can come follow up? Yeah, for sure. So um, I think what we've seen over the years is that indeed vessels get bigger. That means that cranes get higher and have a bigger outreach. Um, and that amplifies kind of the, for instance, sway of the, of, of the containers, right? So it, it just is at a um, bigger height. Uh, the um, sway of a terminal will be bigger. Um, I have heard, but I'm not a specialist in kind of mooring systems that, uh, especially in the Middle East, where you have this, this Karif, that, that kind of constant tension on, on lines, that there are additional mooring systems in place, magnetic mooring system, if I believe correctly, that are sometimes used um, to secure uh, a vessel um, to the key. Of course, I'd say from a... Um, port operations perspective, it's it's one thing to have a, um, a vessel stabilized along the key, but you still have your your cranes, your uh, horizontal transport that's quite impacted by, uh, or could be quite impacted by weather. But um, yes, in terms of additional safety constraint, that might be might be a solution. I think, I think I just want to echo everything that Jasper said. This is something that we're really seeing from the port operations standpoint to really understand how they can optimize their throughput, but they are considering weather. They're considering um, what does it mean from an operation standpoint to actually support um, these larger ships that are coming into the channel that are going sort of through that process. I think Terry's sort of perspective on what that impact means from a tidal standpoint is also something that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And this idea of forecasting tides so that these, these ships can actually get into the channel and then get into the sort of birthing area so that they can start to move that tonnage and that weight off there um, is something that we're, we're sort of seeing more commonly within the port space. Um, Terry, is there anything else that you want to add that you've seen sort of from your perspective? Yeah, I, I think the, the larger the vessel, you know, unfortunately, the, the less maneuverable they are and the more impact that they have from, you know, sort of wind. I, I think we saw that very tragically a year or so ago in the Suez Canal that, you know, and, and so between, you know, sort of the currents, tides and, and winds, um, 
it is more problematic. And I think the the the, the you know the tugs and the, the mooring crews, uh, it's a it's a more challenging task. And and so I think that that's that's something that I think that we're all going to be learning for, from and, and understanding that whether data like spires is going to be more and more critical for, for those types of operations. Okay, so now we've got a question from Nikodem Olsavsky. So LinkedIn says he's a data explorer with MAN Energy, but he's asking about vessel fuel consumption. I don't think anybody on the panel knows about vessel. Oh, yes, but you've said you'd like to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah, I have some background from Maersk, of course, but, but also I want to sort of answer the question a little bit more broadly, maybe. So I, I can't give you an exact sort of a percentage of, of fuel consumption, but it's, it's linked to what um, carriers are, are trying to do, right, to uh, minimize fuel consumptions by, by slow steaming and arrive just in time. And that works fine as long as um, the berth is available and sort of you're able to serve your vessel. Uh, at the potential container terminal. So that impact on fuel consumption for a carrier is actually big, it, it, it's huge. But in addition, kind of the port, the, the terminal operations also have a extreme impact on uh, potential delays because they have to order their gangs, they have to assign their cranes a day, sometimes even um, during a weekend, for instance, uh, two days in advance. So if they don't know how much is coming, they also waste a lot of resources um, and and um, sort of sub-optimize their birth uh, in their operations. So the whole um, fuel consumption is one part of the op operational challenge. I'd say on the terminal operations, it's if, if you only can predict a couple of days in advance that either a terminal has to close or a vessel is delayed, it can save you operationally quite a lot. So that planning aspect is, is pretty important um, in terms of rough weather. Wow. Okay, so we've got a complicated question from Narayanan Submarinian. He's asking specifically at Terry, but he's a, I think, a, I, was trying to, I think DP is departure port. I'm not sure what the LP is, but he's, I think he's asking about the, the software tool to you show what cargoes each vessel are carrying. Can you show which ports the vessels are headed to before their sellings, I think I think he's asking questions about the, this planning tool. I don't know, maybe is that more for Raphael as the maritime person? I don't know. If, uh, I don't quite so, follow the question, to be honest. Yeah, so so I think there are, uh, and and actually Jasper mentioned this. I mean, I, I think that the, the birth <laughs> birth planning is is critically important for for yeah. you know every port that you, as as a port you know the vessels that have you as their destination. You obviously know their estimated time of arrival. You've actually done your birth planning that can be done anywhere up to, you know, sort of two weeks ahead of time. Um, but it is the, you know, I think as, as Jasper mentioned, that has become a lot more problematic and there's a lot more pieces I think that we have to manage. So that birth planning has become, I think, a lot more complicated. There are uh, a number of, you know, sort of birth planning software systems out there. Uh, but I think that it, it's, again, all really relies on having access to very good real-time information about what's, you know, not only where the vessel is, but what's actually occurring in real time at the port. And, and uh, so I think that's it's all critically important in terms of managing that uh, arrival departure. Yeah, it's a complicated relationship between the port and the shipping company. I guess they don't all have the same information. Yeah. Well, and that's where we see the Spire data, right? Really coming in and really supporting that from the AIS side to understand what's coming, where it's going, um, you know, and mashing that up with the weather feed that Spire is also providing can also give us some estimations of potential delays and what that might mean from the shipping side so that the ports, the port operator can actually have that understanding, that visibility sort of properly planned to Jasper's point previously. Oh, very good. So we go to the question from Hoang Chung Ngo, who's a marine services statistician. Um, I think this is a question for um, Kina maybe about your uh, numerical weather prediction model. Can you discuss more about how you're predicting weather beyond 15 days? Is that something you can answer? 
Yeah. So um, I'm not sure if maybe this was intended. I don't know if your guys' platform shows weather out past 15 days, but we don't at the moment produce a forecast past 15 days because at that point, um, any weather forecast is going to be pretty low on scale, uh, owing to the fact that individual, like small errors at the beginning of a forecast are going to propagate through. And so um, there are some 15 day forecasts that are, that are part of our offering, but uh, for the most part, beyond 15 days is really outside the scope of a weather forecast. Okay. Should we go to Marcelo Carlos Patat, who's uh, in Exolgan Container Terminal in Argentina? But I think this may be for Jasper. What's the difference between port chain and marine traffic? I mean, marine traffic is AIS tracking and port chain ah, is okay, analytics. Right. But, uh... Yeah, well, it, it's a good question. So it, we are um, kind of building up this feature of, of AIS predicting, right? But, but our view is to um, sort of tackle the first uh, or the biggest problem first. So currently, um, it is making sure that you um, see the estimated arrival time of only those vessels that you're interested in. So first, it's a little bit of filtering and, and placing it into context, also seeing the impact on your actually uh, birth uh, schedule that you have at your terminal. So it's that incorporation. Uh, of course, we also uh, are focusing on uh, expanding that functionality uh, in our um, view um, the two obvious ways of adding more value to uh, planning in a container terminal. That's one I mentioned a little bit, the alerts. So it's pretty important for many uh, terminals um, when a vessel departs from their previous port because that gives them a better estimate on when they will arrive uh, in time. Um, and the second thing is that there's a lot more data that you can um, uh, combine it with to get a better estimate of your um, ETA. Um, for instance, preferred routing. So it's one thing to know where a vessel is. The obvious question is, when will it arrive at my terminal? And that depends on the routes historically taken and, and sort of the distance sailed. So that's something that um, we could add. Uh, and, and the last thing is um, container ships operate in, in a certain rotation and carriers sometimes take a decision to skip a port and that might have another impact on your um, estimated time of arrival. So what we will do over and above kind of just um, displaying um, a, um, a container vessel, which is a very essential and already value adding first step is, is to add that context uh, to that data and uh, sit together with our birth planners to sort of see how we can improve from there to um, improve their plan. Oh, very good. So we're going from Argentina to Morocco now. So Zakaria Elkar Mali is a terminal operations planner in Tangier in Morocco. But uh, I'm not sure this question is relevant. <laughs> We've been talking about how do you protect the crew working on deck in adverse weather conditions during navigation. But since he's in the planner of the port of Morocco, does anybody want to share any thoughts about that? Or maybe about to Raphael, should we? Or <laughs> I've been on a ship with adverse weather, but um, I'd say harnesses and safety lines and carabiners. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't really have much to add. Oh, very good. So, last question on the board here: Hicham Karufi talking about global port planning for data exchange. I mean, that, that's a question that went through my mind, who's actually in control here? Because if ports are doing their own thing, then uh, I mean, it's only, there's no global birth ship planning organization. So uh, it might be desirable, but we're not going to have it. I don't know. Terry, I saw you had a Master of Arts in Urban Planning. So uh, I don't know if you're the <laughs> <laughs> policy planning person. Do you want to uh, have any, any thoughts on uh, if we had a global planning of vessel movements or if that's something you think there's going to be or maybe a fault to Well, I think there are, um... I, I guess I would say consortiums of international ports that that actually do meet. Um, you know, the there are a certain number of ports in which you know you you have regular traffic, and um, you know they they really uh, get together with some frequency. I've actually been at one or two of those, and and it really is how do they uh, share more information, how do they create more effective linkages between these ports? 
uh, again, I think there's there's maybe two two movements kind of afoot. One is is really the port community systems within some of the larger ports. That is, how do you get all the entities within the port and that port environment uh, really to work together to share information, really with the design of, of really increasing efficiencies and, and port throughput. And then secondly, these these sort of coordination, collaboration between very large international ports uh, that are really looking at how can they develop better collaboration, better linkages between the ports. Uh, in terms of a global uh, vessel traffic management service, I don't think we're quite there yet. So I don't, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, I think th that's uh, maybe off in the future. Uh, there's no uh, sort of um, I ICAO of the, of, the, of the seas, I guess I would say, but, but certainly uh, at some point in time, I think it really does, that there does need to be more international collaboration, coordination, and, and certainly there are various initiatives around the world that, that are really aiming at that, that, that level of, uh, of collaboration. Oh, I've also Jasper, looked up, you wanna, I, looked, you, you, I looked up Hitchim on LinkedIn. He's port call optimization manager, also in Tangier, Morocco. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I just want to, to echo and I completely agree um, with with, uh, with your words, uh, Terry. But sort of, so I don't think we're going to have a global coordination of port calls. But but that's not necessarily maybe what what he uh, he meant to say, right? I think it, it shows the the complexity that there is uh, and the increasing complexity on where uh, planning a, a terminal or port um, has its data from, uh, and it points to me to two important uh, developments. One is, in order to plan. Um, you need to standardize the definitions. And there's great progress being made by DCSA, for instance, to make sure that everyone in the port community and everyone in the logistics chain has the same definition and some kind of you know, definitions of, of the events during a port call, which is a prerequisite on sort of sharing data and, and aligning. So that's one thing. And the other thing that, um, that this might be pointing to is the importance of, of APIs and, and connecting different systems. Um, I don't think we're going to get a global uh, coordination system. Uh, I don't know whether we want to, but at least it's pretty important uh, and increasingly is important to be able to share and have an API available to either export or import um, data and to connect to, to other systems. Um, and lastly, um, Sort of, there is some attempts, at least currently in the US, to have a kind of an appointment system, a queuing system on container terminals, especially those container terminals that are heavily congested, so that you can actually claim your spot um, and then arrive later on, so that at least sort of the carriers can optimize a little bit and, and minimize their fuel consumption a little bit. And of course, that also includes uh, a definition and a collaboration between uh, terminals and, and carriers uh, to do such. So uh, it's, a, it's a great question. It just shows the complexity of, of current uh, planning operations, I'd say. Wow, that's fantastic. So we'll go back to Argentina. So Marcelo Carlos Patat is asking, we're very concerned about climate change and how can you use tools to predict and evaluate pressure and winds? How can Spire help to improve the prediction? So I'll just go to you, Keenan. Do you want to yeah, yeah, totally. So I think uh, Mark Marcello was saying they have a, a ton of tools that they do use. Uh, so one, I think our one big way that we can help with this and and add value is uh, for a globe. When you look at global model output uh, for a given model, you are going to have data for that port be interpolated from some distance to a nearby grid point. Um, our port optimized forecast is instead going to do some of that interpolation as the first step, but then is doing the optimization on the multiple inputs, including our own deterministic model, which our own model includes a number of RO profiles uh, achieved during, you know, using our satellite network, which improves our forecast overall. Um, but so the, our port optimized solution is, is aimed at getting a tailored forecast to that specific port, you know, trying to overcome some of the uh, errors that get built in when you do some of this interpolation to it, to the port location from a global model, um, et cetera. 
Yeah. Yeah. If, if I could add to that, I mean, I think that, you know, we certainly have been spending a great deal of time looking at climate resiliency. And I think climate resiliency for the ports is just going to be a huge future issue with, with sea level rise and, and a, a whole range of, of sort of climatic events, you know, associated with, with climate change. And I think that, you know, we're, you know, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not sure that the ports are, you know, or all the ports are, are really kind of addressing that yet in the way that they're, they're going to need to. And certainly some of the, the latest uh, UN data suggests that, you know, it, it's going to be occurring faster than, than we anticipated. And, and so the, the, for example, on the east coast of the U.S., they're talking about 14 inches over the next 20 years. And, and you know, so those are, you know, th those are going to have very, very significant impacts. And obviously, our ports are kind of on the front line of that. And so I think climate resiliency is going to be a, a, just a, a huge issue that, that ports are going to have to face. Well, one question in, in my mind, we have a lot of people in our audience who are running ships, but not ports. How much of this can they actually do? I guess, can they use services like this to better plan their entries into ports and uh, arrive better on time? Is that, is that something people should be thinking more of? I don't know who's uh, got most involvement in maritime operations, perhaps Keenan, is it, or Raphael? Is it, or... I mean, I can just say that our, that's like the exact thing we're trying to get at with this insights project that, that gives you this uh, warning forecast for a waypoint, you know, giving a set of waypoints as an input and also just the route, the forecast by route uh, is the same, same purpose is to get at that, uh, the mid-ocean issues. Maybe another piece to that, uh, you know, back to the Port of Rotterdam, I mean, they're actually spending a great deal of, they're actually building what they call a digital twin and and the whole point behind that is they're really forecasting ahead to autonomous navigation so the the the, the day in which we're really going to have autonomous vessels uh navigating literally into port and and so i guess maybe back to that question about that global uh they're, they're, they're perhaps at that stage i think we might need to sort of think about uh a, a greater level of of uh coordination uh so that we make sure that these autonomous vessels are uh, are actually uh you know, safe and and uh but but certainly I know a number of the, really the, the largest international ports really are looking at that and really looking at how do they begin to build the infrastructure today to really uh, take advantage of autonomous uh, vessel navigation in the future. And, and obviously weather is going to have to play a critical role in that routing. I mean, because it is really going to need to be weather dependent routing, uh, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. But most ships got pretty sophisticated electronic navigation systems with their electronic chart systems. Well, that's not a world Esri's ever been into, but I guess you, you could do. You could overlay weather information. We could see coming into berths, and I don't know how far you've got into that. Isn't it? We, we do the charts. Uh, any any time that there are the potential of deaths uh, associated, with, we try to steer clear a little bit of the ectus, uh, but uh, we do have. Uh, uh, obviously, partners that uh, take our technology and, and go into that go into that arena. Well, well, that sounds great. Well, we've just got a few minutes left. I don't know if um, you'd like to take a minute each to give any 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 lasting words what you'd like to leave, leave people with. Um, maybe if we go to Jasper and then Raphael, should we, and then uh, then Terry and Keenan, perhaps. Is there anything you'd like to say before we finish? Well, I, I hope I've, I made clear, and I think the discussion made clear that um, planning and planning ahead is. Um, is increasingly important and difficult and, and requires uh, collaboration. Uh, I think that that's my main thought. Um, digitize your processes and create that transparency and, and single source of truth, I'd say, to both terminals and carriers, basically, in order to improve. Well, Raphael, you want to take a minute for last words? Yeah, I think I think I want to echo a lot of what Jasper said. That single source of truth, understanding what is going on at a at a port at that level to really effectively understand how to move cargo and material is incredibly important. And when you can do have a single place where you have that situational awareness to see and forecast when ships are arriving, 
what the weather might look like, what your throughput could be. You're really going to be able to optimize for that port community and everybody that along that sort of supply chain. And then also support that, that sort of mission that we have to reduce carbon across the global chain, right? Um, and sort of understanding what that looks like. So yeah. Well, Terry, do you want to take a last minute? Um, yeah, I, just to echo, uh, I really do think it's fundamentally all about having data, good real-time data and, and you know, planning, as, as Jasper has said, has become much more complex, but much more critical, uh, I think, really to optimizing performance. And, and again, I think being able to really sort of uh, consume all of that information, visualize it, analyze it, and ultimately, at the end of the day, it's to how, how can you make better decisions and how can you optimize throughput? And certainly, I think Spire's data is a critical piece of that, both vessel location, but also the weather. And how do you, how do you pull all those together in a way that really gives you much better uh, situational intelligence? So yeah, that's Keenan. at the end of the day. Yeah, Keenan, mm -hmm. I guess people aren't thinking about weather enough, or there's a lot more happening with weather people aren't necessarily aware of. So this is the, uh, maybe an important point. We can do this stuff a lot better if we think about weather more. Is that what you... <laughs> exactly. I, I mean, I will say, that just to echo Terry's point about accuracy, I think it all kind of comes down to accuracy, because like, if you take this weather data, you, you can find weather data to put into your systems uh, from a number of different sources. But if that data is not accurate in the first place, it's, you know, the saying is garbage in, garbage out, right? So, you know, that, 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 that's a big factor in how useful this stuff is going to be to the maritime industry. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, we've got the last question. Anybody wants to answer this in two minutes? <laughs> Evergreen incident in the Suez Canal could have been prevented with better weather data. Is that right to say? I guess probably you wouldn't want to answer that unless anybody... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's well, uh... Move on. Well, that's a uh, yeah. It might, might be legal issues to <laughs> answering that question. I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thanks very much. I think we uh, had whole new areas about ports and weather and showed lots of efficiencies that people haven't thought of. Opportunities to reduce carbon emissions and reduce costs and it's a whole new subject. So I shall pass back to Neff for the closing words. And thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Carl. Uh, th thank you to all our speakers for walking us through all the complex factors that can affect um, our port operations. Uh, before I sign off, just to remind everyone that we hold uh, webinars regularly and follow us on LinkedIn or our web page to keep up to date with that. Thank you to all our speakers once again. Have a good evening. Oh, geez. Bye-bye. Right, thank you.